But uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking this morning in our series in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We've got to chapter 5, and we're going to look uh, together from verse 1 through to verse uh, 21. So Ephesians chapter 5, and from verse 1 to 21. And as we turn uh, to the Bible, uh, let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, these next few minutes that you would give us grace to be free from distraction. Help us to have an attentive mind and an open heart. Uh, We pray, Lord, that the seed of your word uh, would uh, not only be heard, but uh, accepted, received. And we pray, Lord, that your word by your spirit would do its work for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friends, uh, let's hear God's word. The Apostle Paul is writing. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who are you imitating? If I was to ask you that question, I wonder how you reply. Who are you imitating? Perhaps you'd say to me, I'm I'm utterly an individual and I'm not really imitating anyone at all. It reminds me that response of uh, the famous scene from Monty Python's controversial movie, The Life of Brian. Brian is looking out over a window at a mass crowd in front of him and he says to the whole crowd, you are all individuals. And as one voice, they all intone back, we are all individuals. He says, you are all different. And all together they say, we are all different. And rather marvelously, uh, one person uh, unscripted, it was, wasn't part of the original script, but unscripted, as they say, we are all different, one person puts up his hand and said, I'm not, <laughs> which is a real philosophical mind bender. Um, who are you imitating? For business leaders of a certain generation, Jack Welch, the well-known um, former leader of General Electric, was, Electric was, a, was a, a model. For others, he was 
Certainly not a model. The younger generation of business leaders, of course, is Steve Jobs. And there was a time when everyone who wanted to be at the cutting edge of business leadership bought himself several black polo necks and finish every presentation with, and now for something entirely different. And yet one more thing, or whatever his famous catchphrase was at the end, you can tell I don't follow Steve Jobs because I can't quite recall exactly what it was, but at the end of every presentation, he had this little phrase. You could hear it repeated down through other business leaders. Who are you imitating? Could be in business, could be in life. It, the same sort of thing happens in church life, you know. When I'm in one of my slightly irreverent modes and grouping, uh, with a group of friends, I, I like to occasionally go through imitating well-known preachers. You should try it sometime. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> when John Stott, who was influential for an older generation, was around, you could, you could hear the cadence of of the way he would speak be reflected in those who followed him, who were influenced by him. Stott would often have three points, and they would rise to a crescendo. Uh, something like, um, my first point is the perspicuity of Scripture. My second point is the uh, sufficiency of Scripture. And third, the authority of Scripture. It's always like that. Not always, but, uh, but uh, uh, he's one of my heroes. And, I'm not. Flatter, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You know? Or John Piper for a younger generation. He's fun to imitate. Some point in Piper's talks, he, he, he often does something like this. And if you go around the country and you go to some small little Baptist church in the little nowhere and you see some preacher go you know who he's been watching and listening to, and he's a good person to listen to. Listen to his stuff, for sure. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, has been saying so far in the first half of it, chapters 1 to 3, that we have a position in the heavenly places. Because of this position, now in the second half, he's urging us to pick up the pace, to walk in a certain kind of way. Now he comes to this section where he's saying, D imitate God. How on earth do we do that? He gives us three kinds of walking. First, walk in love. This run runs from verses 1 to 6. He says, therefore, and each of these three walks are introduced by the word therefore, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love. But as he defines what he means by love, he defines it in a way that is not how so often we define it in our culture today. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, we think we understand that, but look how the Apostle Paul carries on. Walk in love, which means how Jesus loved us, but not like this. But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness, that is, love's being disordered, don't do that. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, not that kind of loose love. And the antidote to that is thanksgiving and praise. If you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral and pure, who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. What a thing to say today. The Apostle Paul is defining love in a way very different from the way it is defined in our, in, in our culture. Let no one deceive you empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The church at large has got so wrong-headed about this. The phrase is, love wins. As if that's the only, other, only thing to say. I remember having a conversation once with a Christian leader about this who 
uh, got into trouble through a book that he written on, on this sort of theme, basically saying, because God is love, therefore everyone in the end is going to be saved. And one of my principles about public ministry is not to criticize another Christian leader publicly, unless I've at least tried to talk to them privately. And I called up this chap and asked him how he'd arrived at his conclusions. I was fascinated by his answer. He said to me, I start from the um, principle that what ultimately defines God in every way is that He is love. And I thought to myself, well, if you start there, it's no wonder you end up over here. Of course the Bible says that God is love, but that's not all the Bible says about God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. God is a God of justice and wrath. And therefore, His love is ultimately defined by the cross. Walk in love as Christ loved us uh, and gave Himself up for us, taking the wrath of God in our place. I think it was Alistair Begg in one of his sermons on this sort of theme at one point said, I want our rainbow back. I want our love back. You want a society that loves one another? The way to do that is not to say that it doesn't matter whatever anyone does. The people's lives have been destroyed. City centers have been devastated. Families have been wrecked. That's not love. Oh yeah, walk in love, but let it be defined as the Bible defines it. Which means, second, walk in light. Uh, verses 7 through to 14. Again, therefore, you see the way it's structured? Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Which means, walk in light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. It's the, it's the moral goodness of God as shining from His Word. Which means, you can discern what is pleasing to the Lord. When you listen to the light of God as the Word of God is, is, is shone all around, you can seek to find out what pleases God by listening to His Word. And then look at the balance here. He's emphasizing purity in a nuanced way and then connecting it massively surprisingly to evangelism. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, yes, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. That first part of that nuance there is, is sometimes used by, in, in social media circles when, when there's a scandal or something like that, and, and, and it said, look, we need to expose it. Well, okay, verse 11, but you need to read the next verse. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. <laughs> Exposed, but not in such a way that you go into graphic detail. It's shameful even to mention what they do in secret. Not to hide it, but don't, don't use it as, as a way to build social media followers by talking about every little dirty bit. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. That, <laughs> that's one of those parts of the Apostle Paul. I was talking, we had a preacher's conference last week, and I was talking with a colleague there about how the Apostle Paul, when I'm preaching from him, I often think to myself, and I think I've mentioned this a couple of times through the series, that I often think to myself, I wish he'd learned how to write. And he said, yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think the Apostle Paul sometimes just needed a good editor. And that's, this is one of these places, it's very hard to figure out exactly what he's saying. I think what he's saying is that when the light shines, then you can see. 
which is why then he goes on. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleep, and arise from the dead. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Ephesians or study it might realize that this part here is one of those parts that's been lots of conversation about in commentaries and in sermons and, uh, and that sort of thing, because the Apostle Paul introduces the, the, the phrase, awake, O sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you, by saying, it says, which is his characteristic way of introducing a piece of Scripture, and yet no one's quite sure where he's quoting from. To my mind, he's quoting in a free way from Isaiah chapter 60. Preachers often do that. They'll summarize something. Look, it says this, and I think he's quoting from Isaiah 60, which is all about the fruitfulness of God's light shining, which then creates evangelistic effectiveness, purity connected to evangelism. Surprisingly, Isaiah 60 goes like this, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes, now you see, because the light's shining, it's visible. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together and they come to you. Your sons shall, shall come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. In other words, when God's light shines, when there's purity of light, there's evangelistically there's evangelistic effectiveness. How different from the, what we have been taught in the last 30, 40 years in the evangelical church. The way to reach people for Christ is not to downplay the moral differences that we have between those who follow Jesus and those who don't follow Jesus. Wrong-headed. What attracts people to Jesus is not that he's the same as everyone else. What attracts people to Jesus is that he's different. There's hope. There's light. It's not all darkness. Of course, we remove unbiblical stumbling blocks and we try to say things in reasonably creative and imaginative ways and we don't talk in the language of 17th century Puritanism and all that. But we don't, don't downplay the moral differences. We play them up. We're clear about them. We don't hide them. And that brings people to Christ. You know, it is the churches that downplay those moral distinctions that are dying. And the churches that shine the light. God's Spirit draws people to Him. If you follow uh, church news, you'll be aware that the global Anglican communion is going through a huge controversy. Canterbury, which is the, the, the historic center of the Anglican Communion, has in its wisdom declared that uh, from now on it will be allowed to marry homosexually active couples. I, I think the actual phrase is blessing homosexual matrimony or something like that. So often in these ecclesiastical dictacts that they're written in a sort of George Orwellian doublespeak. But basically what they're saying is that's going to be fine now and you can carry on. I know someone who's a minister, in the, I know many people in the minister of the Anglican Communion, but one person I know who's a minister in the Anglican Communion has just said, I will not do that. And another person who, who heard that was describing the situation to his barber, a non-Christian who was cutting his hair, described the situation, this person just said, I will not do it. And the barber, who's a non-Christian, said, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Isn't it obvious? The light shines and the darkness goes. Oh, we are, we're a place of love. Anyone's welcome. We've all got sins and struggles and difficulties. We're not going to embarrass anyone or... We don't want Pharisaism anywhere near this church. We're all broken sinners at the foot of the cross. 
But the way to find healing is not to downplay the light. It's the light that brings healing and life. You've probably heard the phrase woke. Somewhat similar to the Alistair Begg phrase, I want our rainbow back. I want our waking up back. What will wake us up? The Apostle Paul tells us, Christ shines on us. Walk in love, walk in light. Well, that's difficult though, isn't it? Because it's difficult in church circles, but it's, I would say, almost certainly more difficult as a working man or woman or someone who's at, teaching at a school. How do we do this? And so the Apostle Paul then says, having said walk in love, as biblically defined, walk in light, which leads him to offer the gospel, Awake, O sleeper, Christ will shine on you. And then third, walk in not just love and light, but third, wisdom. Verse 15 to uh, the end of our passage, verse 21, verse 15 to the end, walk in wisdom. So he says, look carefully then, or look carefully therefore, how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, walk in wisdom. What does that mean? What it, the Apostle Paul has this, he's such a genius, he has this brilliant balance once again in this passage. So, walking in wisdom means using time rightly, but having a purpose to do the right thing in that time. So, making the best use of the time because the days are evil, so that's using your time rightly. Planning out your time, using it, being careful of your time, the hours, the minutes, and the seconds, not wasting time because the days are evil, because people need to hear the gospel, because they need our moral influence and kindness and love and compassion. Every moment counts, make, make the most of the time. But then, verse 17, we need direction as well as good time management. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the, Lord, the will of the Lord is. We understand what the will of the Lord is from the Word of the Lord, which is why we gather together on Sunday mornings to hear God's Word. But we need to make the best use of the time, but then we need to know what to do with that time. It may be true, as one great management consultant used to say, that unless you can manage time, you cannot manage anything. Absolutely true. But it is also true that efficient use of time doing the wrong thing is the biggest waste of time. What we need is not just efficient use of time, but doing the right thing, prioritizing the gospel, seeking first the kingdom of God. It is a huge waste of a life to give every second, every minute, carefully counting how you're going to use it just to build bigger and bigger bonds of money. What a waste of a life. Understand what the Lord's will is. Use your life for the gospel and use it efficiently, but for the right purpose. See how he balances it. And then with the wisdom, he balances spirituality with mutuality. Again, it's brilliant how he does it. He says then, and do not get drunk with wine, uh, which is debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And as I think is probably well known in most church circles, because it's been preached on so often, the, the phrase there has, it, it's an ongoing uh, emphasis. So go on, be being filled with the Spirit, not just a one-off event. So the solution to intoxication whether it's alcohol or drugs or anything else, is the ongoing filling of the Spirit. And how does that happen? Not only spirituality, but mutuality. Verse, 18, uh, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the, heart with your, uh, to the Lord with your heart. In other words, what we've been doing this morning Um, it was, it's been wonderful to hear the music today and hear the extraordinary gifted singing we have. Uh, it always slightly intimidates me. Um, you, some of you know that we have a children's choir and uh, a dear uh, brother in the church asked me recently whether our children had ever been in the children's choir and my quick answer was no, Don't, haven't you heard us sing? Um, we're not very good. Um, and when it comes to singing songs, I think to myself, who wants to hear me sing? 
But then I look at the text like this, and I realize that's not the point. When we sing together, we not only sing to God, which, of course, is what we're doing, we also sing to each other. You ever thought about that? It could be that there's someone here this morning who has noticed how you have sung. You sing in the pews, how you have sung. And is going away this morning thinking to themselves, those people actually believe it. Why? Because they're making melody to the Lord with your heart. That is, it's, you actually believe it, the way you sing. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You notice how this last bit of walking in wisdom, the, the balance of the right use of time with the right, for the right purpose, and then the spirituality and the mutuality, but then you notice how he tops and tails the whole passage he began by saying, imitate God, and at the end he says, out of fear of Christ. It's what's known as an inclusio, a top and a tail of a passage, so that we understand that to imitate God means to imitate Jesus, because he's God. Walk in wisdom. Brothers and sisters, will you not believe the lie that is so prom predominant these days that Christianity is somehow for the foolish and the uneducated? Will you not believe the lie that somehow it is more sophisticated to be an atheist? Will you not believe the lie that somehow it is more intelligent to believe less about the Bible rather than to be believe the whole Bible? Walk in wisdom. There are deep roots and profound thoughts in the Bible and in the Christian teachers down through the years that reflected the Bible. Tertullian, one example, 160 AD, a brilliant man, a controversial man at times, but a brilliant man. He has this amazing phrase. Where he says that, the, 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 that God became human and then died and then rose again. It's true because it's impossible, incredible because it is absurd which doesn't mean, as some people thought it means, that he's sort of coming up with some strange paradox. What Tertullian means is, who would have invented such an idea? No human would have invented that idea, which is good evidence that it comes from God. It's impossible because it's absurd. It's believable because, because who would have thought of it? Tertullian, brilliant. Oregon, again, a controversial figure in all sorts of ways, but a great scholar. Oregon, did you know, it's usually said, um, wrote over 2,000 books. Now, just think about that. I've written 15. If I'm alive for another 30, I'm going to really have to pick up my pace. <laughs> 2,000! Fred Hoyle, so Fred Hoyle, a fellow of the Royal Society who died in 2001, was the scientist who came up with the term the Big Bang for the origin of life, though he afterwards, I'm told, repudiated that term. He said, we need to admit to ourselves that the likelihood of this whole universe having happened by chance is the same likelihood as rolling a six when you roll a dice five million consecutive times. You think being an atheist makes more sense? Oh, walk in wisdom? I want our rainbow back. I want our waking up back, I want our education back. Wisdom. In Australia, there's a bird called a lyre bird. And the Australian 
lyre bird, I'm told, uh, has a particularly unusual characteristic. Not only does it sing a lot between June and September, about four hours per day, which is about half the daylight hours, of course, it's also known for being able to imitate other sounds. It imitates other animals, it imitates car alarms, chainsaws, baby crying. Uh, if you are privileged to be a parent and you've seen your baby in its mother's arms and the way that baby, when it is awake, stares up at the mother's face, It's unnerving being a parent, actually, isn't it? As they get older, you realize your children pick up different bits of your own personality, and you think to yourself, I wish they hadn't picked up that bit, but the other bit, you know? It's a bit like holding a mirror back to yourself in some ways. They become their own people. Who are you imitating? If this morning the Spirit of Christ brings you to new life, you have this amazing call before you. Not only are your position now in Christ in the heavenly places, but because of that, the Apostle Paul says it's time to pick up the pace. Walk in love, as biblically defined. Walk in light. And yes, walk in wisdom. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, we do uh, thank you for your word, and we pray you'd help us to be faithful to it. We pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, you would wake up those who need to be woken up. We pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom to walk in love and walk in light. And we pray these things in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.